السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد um, today's um, session we have a few questions and the questioners initials are K R first question says I am at a new school and have three minutes between periods to pray dhuhr is it permissible to pray two raka'ah qasr salah or should I pray the regular four raka'ah uh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم first and foremost we say that the prayer is from the most important things that a Muslim must do in his daily life, rather in his entire life. The prayer is the second pillar of Al-Islam. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made obligatory upon all of his slaves, those who are learned and those who aren't learned, those who are wealthy and those who are not wealthy, men and women, black and white, red and yellow, those who are traveling, those who are residents, those who have good physical health, and those who suffer from poor physical health. No matter what the case is, if you have your sense of awareness, your mental faculty, if you're in a sane state, then you must offer the prayer. Um, there are so many different verses in the Quran al kareem and in the authentic hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that show us the importance of the prayer, its virtue the severe sin and crime of those who do not perform it or those who waste it um, the dispraise of those who stand lazily therein and the list goes on the messenger of Allah has told us that the thing between us and them the non-Muslims the rejectors of faith are, or that thing is the prayer so therefore uh, Allah Azza wa he tells us uh, in Surah Al-Nisa speaking about the verse of that which the ulama of Islam call Ayatul Khawf or Salatul Khawf the prayer of fear in other words when the Muslims have uh, met their enemies they are not exempt from offering the prayer Allah Azza wa tells them what to do and he instructs them one group of Muslims should stand in the front while another group of Muslims offers the prayer in the back one group of Muslims the Imam is to stay with and another group of Muslims the Imam so on and so forth etc the topic of uh, our discussion here is not the rulings of the prayer of fear but I'm trying to get to a point and that is after Allah Azza wa Jalla instructed the believers instructed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to the prayer in this time of fear he says um, establish the prayer when you feel safe when you're at ease when you have the ability establish the prayer inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban munkuta because the prayer is obligatory upon the believers in a prescribed time. In other words, the believers, when they're doing such a serious act as fighting in Allah's cause, they are not exempt from offering the prayer in the proper manner, in the proper time. So therefore, if uh, that's the case with regards to uh, that verse, then what about when you're home, when you're not fighting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause, the prayer is even uh, more serious. Okay, so therefore, under any circumstance, is a believer allowed to shorten his prayers and he's not a traveler the only time in which you're allowed to shorten your prayers is when you are traveling as for combining the prayers when you're not traveling that's a different issue okay that's a definition that we're not getting into right now but shorting them is from the specifics of the traveler when the messenger of Allah offered the prayer in the authentic hadith okay in Bukhari Muslim and he salamed out after he made two raka. He made raka attain two units of the prayer. That man, Dhul Gadain, he said, Was the prayer shortened or did you forget, O Messenger of Allah? Sallam? The Messenger والسلام, said, I didn't forget, nor was the prayer shortened. He says, Rather, you have, O Messenger of Allah. The point that we're trying to get to, as the hadith clearly proves, that if a man only makes two raka, his prayer is incomplete and it is not considered to have been fulfilled. So therefore, um, you are not allowed to shorten your prayers unless you are a traveler. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Next question says, After wudu, if you see a part of your body that isn't covered, for instance, your arms aren't wet to your elbows, do you have to make wudu again? Or can you just wash that part? We say that some of the people of knowledge hold the opinion that um, al muwala which means to do things in succession to do one part right after another okay in a continual motion 
many of the people of knowledge hold the view that this is mandatory and it must be done in one's wudu. Okay? He is not allowed to wash his arm and allow the arm to dry and then uh, wipe his head. Okay? Rather, he must do these things all in one success, one uh, uh, fluid motion unless there is an excuse, extreme heat, extreme cold, so on and so forth. So therefore, if you, rem if you see that you didn't complete the washing of your arms or any part of your body, uh, we all know that is obligatory. Whereas there are many hadith in which the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu um, he saw a man who had a spot on his foot. Then he didn't wash, it was still dry. And he told the man to finish his wudu. And there's several other texts that clearly prove the obligation of perfecting one's wudu. As the Messenger of Allah والسلام, has instructed us to complete our wudu and told us about the virtues of doing so. So therefore there's two types of completing one's wudu. First is that which is obligatory, mandatory. And the second is that which is a virtue, that which is excellent. So therefore it is a mandatory to cover the parts of the body that Allah Azawajal has addressed in the Quran al Kareem. Allah says, فَغْسِرُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَيْدِيَكُمْ Allah says, wash your faces, wash your hands, and your arms. He says, إِلَى marafiq Up to your elbows. So therefore, when making wudu, from the fingertips all the way to the elbows, it must be washed. So if you discover that you haven't washed it, then you haven't completed your wudu. And if you haven't completed your wudu, and a long time went by, you dried off, you walked away, you left the bathroom, you used the paper towel, you realize that you left out a certain part, then it goes back to what we previously established of al muwala of many of the ulama holding it obligatory to do the wudu in a succession. As for if a short period of time passes by, uh, you just noticed it, then that what you have to do is wash that part that you forgot or left off and then finish your wudu. You don't have to go all the way back to the beginning. So therefore, you left out a part on your arm, wash your arm, and then finish. You don't have to go all the way back to your mouth and your nose, etc. Uh, next question says, I found a couple of really great Seder books and podcasts like the Sealed Nectar and Column Institute Seder Podcast. Can you recommend any more that are available to me? We say that the Seder is something that is crucial and vital for every single Muslim, let alone the student of knowledge, let alone the Muslim who wishes to be studious and increase himself or herself and knowledge and awareness of the deen to study and to read on a daily basis. You have to have Seder. Uh, it's the seerah is your bread and your butter. It is your practice, your understanding, your application of the deen from A to Z. Seerah is everything. What did the Prophet do? How did he do it? What did the Prophet say and how did he say it? What did Allah send down to the Prophet in every aspect of the deen? From Aqidah to politics. So therefore seerah is very important. It's a very good question. And there are many different books in the English language with regards to the seerah. He mentioned the seerah nectar. Um, there are many classical books and modern day books of the Prophet والسلام, some made by the Muslims some made by non-Muslims some books are good and thorough some not so good and thorough um, I don't know him we will try to email you a list of some of these books um, History of Islam Fiqh uh, there there's so many different books uh, Ibn Hisham many of these books are available in the English language uh, Zad al Ma'ad of Ibn al Qayyim is an excellent work. There's also an abridged summarized version of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah, Suleiman ibn Abdullah, uh, uh, the son or the grandson of uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. He has a uh, work on the Sirah that's in English, I believe, it's in two volumes. Uh, from the best books that I would recommend are two. Um, the first is the book of a Nawi called Tahdib wa Sirat al Nabawiyyah, which is a summarized version of a bigger classical book. And the second is Al Fusul fi Sirat al Rasul of Al Hafidh ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And bi Azza wa Jalla, you should find both of them in the English language. But the book of Anawi is uh, stellar, in my humble opinion, and Allah knows best. Next question says When you hear or, or when you say or hear the Prophet, وسلم, when you hear or say the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم's name, do you say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Alayhi Salatu Wasalam or peace be on you or either of them? Fine. And also, what should you do if you forget to say it and realize it later? We say that um, anything that proves 
that you're sending prayers and asking Allah Azza wa Jalla to extol these prayers, and, uh, salutations, safety, and blessings upon the Prophet Aisha his family members, and his companions, they're all fine by the name of Azza wa Jalla. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alayhi salatu wa salam, la bas. It's a very simple issue. Al Muhim is that you do it. As the Prophet sallallahu has explained to us the virtue of that. He says, anyone who sends one prayer upon me, Allah will give him ten of the likes. Uh, Abdullah ibn Umar عنهم, and others have narrated, as the collected by Imam Ahmed and Imam Tirmidhi and others, and Hafid bin Hajar rahimahullah, has a specific book on this hadith, in which he concludes that the hadith is fair, it's hasan. It's acceptable hadith in which he says, He says, those who will be the closest to me, and will have the most right to me on the day of judgment are the ones who send the most prayers upon me. So therefore, um, sending prayers upon a Prophet is very important. It's very virtuous. And we all know what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has explained to us about the cheap one, the stingy miser. The one when my name is mentioned, he doesn't say so, Alaihi Wasallam. So therefore, it's a very, very uh, virtuous act. Um, and this is also, not to get off the topic, but it's also from the greatest fruits that you reap from studying hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And busying yourself with the Prophet Ali Sallam's narrations is that you want to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a hundred times in one page, in an hour a hundred times. And I can remember uh, some years back um, in the class of our Sheikh Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Hafidullah Taala, um, in which he finished, um, if my memory serves me correctly, I believe it was Sahih Al Bukhari, um, and they asked him uh, a few questions when he, you know, upon completion of the book which it took years to do, and it's a major feat. He's explained it before, and the Shaykh uh, Ta'ala, he, he was asked, he says, how many times do you think you said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And I remember sitting there, and the Shaykh, he like, he stood back for a second, and he like, had to think about it, like, SubhanAllah, you know, years and years of teaching that book, how many good deeds did he rack up? Okay, subhanAllah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very important concept for the Muslim not to take lightly. Sending prayers upon the Messenger of Allah, and from the best ways and easy ways of doing that is studying hadith, studying hadith of the Prophet. Wallahu alam. Next question says um, What should you do when you forget to say, inshallah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran, Surah Al Kaf. And do not say anything. Okay, it says, it says, do not say anything that I'm going to do this and that tomorrow unless Allah wills. So, therefore, saying inshallah is from the most important Islamic etiquettes. Whereas you realize that Allah is in control, Allah is in power. Allah says, and you cannot will, you cannot wish to do anything unless it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. So therefore, for the slave to understand this and to realize this and to say this is a very good thing in an Islam. If you forget, ask Allah to forgive you. Ask Allah to make you firm. Seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, the devil is one who causes slaves to forget. As Al-Khadir alayhi salatu wasalam said to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he says, وَمَا أَنْسَانِي إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ He says, and the only thing that caused me to forget the fish when we were back there was the devil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Next question says, If you watch a magic show without participating, is it haram or should I just stay away from it? Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran and Kareem, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Allah says, Do not go near that which you have no knowledge of. Don't approach that which you're ignorant of and that which you're unaware of. This magician or soothsayer, Whatever type of magic he's doing, or sorcery, whatever type of magic, because there are different types of magic, and different levels of magic. There's one thing for sure that he has no knowledge about what he's talking about and what he's doing. Okay, Rajman bil Ghaib. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the people of the kaf, the people of the cave, that men will come and guess, okay, and uh, throw shots in the dark, okay, trying to figure out what that, what, that which they don't know what they're talking about. So the Muslim is to avoid that which he has no knowledge of. Um, this is a general ruling to stay away from this. As for magic, or in a proper terminology, sorcery, or witchcraft, in its proper understanding, then there lies no doubt this is from the most destructive sins in Al-Islam, uh, and it's from Kufr Akbar, billah, major disbelief in Al-Islam. As the Messenger of Allah, 
Taurus in a hadith of Abu Huraira, a Bukhari, a Muslim, Ijtanibu Sab al Mu Asab al Mubiqat. He said, Avoid seven destroyers. And he mentioned from them, he says, was seher. It's a sorcery. So therefore, uh, Suleiman alayhi salam, there were some of the enemies of Islam who accused him of practicing magic and sorcery. And Allah clearly uh, determined that he was free from that. And he never did that. He never practiced that. Uh, but he says, وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا He says, but the devils and the demons, they had committed major disbelief by their practice of sorcery and magic. The Messenger of Allah sallam, has told us in many authentic hadith uh, about the threat of those who go to a soothsayer and some narrations of those who go to a magician or sorcerer and ask them about things okay uh, and will be the punishment of those who ask them disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not having their prayer accepted so on and so forth so therefore this is from the major sins in Al-Islam even if you don't necessarily believe them which is a uh, okay or seek their guidance okay shirk and kufr but just participating with them, supporting them, watching them, these things, these are all things that must be avoided very strictly because they will lead to other things that are worse and more hard. Um, next question says, in module two, you talked about jihad with the pen. Since I'm in a magnet school focused on journalism, do you think it would be a good idea when I get the opportunity that I should do a project about Islam? Do you have any tips on that? Uh, the questioner here is speaking about um, an educational uh, seminar that we did in Windsor, Connecticut this past summer. And we were speaking about a jihad in Allah's cause. It's different types and categories and virtues. And we mentioned from the types of jihad in Allah's Allah's cause is that which the people of knowledge call jihad al-qalam. Fighting with the pen, quote unquote. Or jihad al-hujjah. Fighting with the proof and with the argument. Or, or verbal jihad if you uh, like to say. Um, therefore, uh, defending Islam from the doubts and the different attacks and the assaults that are launched and levied and hurled against it, uh, propagating Islam, okay, offensive, okay, taking the offensive, talking about Islam and pushing it and spreading it, teaching Islam, attacking Kufr and the people of Kufr, okay, and finding the major loopholes and the mistakes and their religions and their uh, ways of life and their faiths, quote unquote, this is all from jihad and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause, whether it's defending the deen with the pen or whether it is propagating the deen with the pen. Um, so, therefore, this is from the most virtuous acts in this time, in any time, but especially in this time, in which Islam is being attacked from so many different angles and aspects. There are Muslims who attack Islam, whether they realize it or not. And there are people who do realize that they attack Islam that aren't Muslim. Okay, um, the creed of Islam, politics of Islam, the Quran and Kareem, Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the list goes on. So therefore, this is very important for Muslims and students of knowledge, and scholars, ulama, learned men and women to handle this task. Um, as for tips, then first and foremost is that you have to have knowledge. You must have the proper in yourself, proper education yourself, not a little bit. Not in the middle, but you must be mutadalli'. You must be mutadalli'. As the ulama say, in this word, in the Arabic language, tadalli' um, comes from three basic letters. Bala'a. And you know that a person's rib, dala'a, as the Prophet ﷺ told us in the Hadith Abi Hurairah, that Hawa was created from a dala'a, from a rib. So therefore, the meaning of this word mutadalli' means that when a person drinks water, he drinks so much that his belly swells and as if his ribs protrude. As if the meat or the, the honey, what's in his belly is sticking to his ribs, poking out of his ribs. In other words, that is how you are to have knowledge of the deen. You are to be armed with ilm. Not a little bit of ilm, not in the middle, but you are to be an expert, a master. Firmly grounded, strong with knowledge. So much so that the knowledge is poured out your skin. You know the Quran, the Hadith, the Arabic language, their doubts, what they want to bring, so on and so on and so forth. Strong. As for if you're not properly trained, then you shouldn't fight. If you're not properly trained, then it's not upon you to bear arms against your enemy. Even though they may be your enemy, it's not for you to do so. Okay, you pass on a book or a tape or a lecture. As for you yourself, performing this type of jihad, talking and speaking and debating, 
then it is something that you must have an abundant amount of knowledge of. Allah Azza wa Jal, He tells us in the glorious Quran, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيدِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنَ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ In the end of Surah Yusuf, Allah tells us, Say, O Muhammad, هَذِهِ سَبِيدِ This is my path, and which I call to Allah upon Basira, with knowledge, insight, wisdom, piercing thought. This is what I do, and this is the task of my followers also. And how perfect is Allah, and I'm not from the mushrikeen, the polytheists, and the idolaters. Um, so therefore, having knowledge of the deen, um, strong knowledge, insight, wisdom, is a standard condition for the da'iyah, and the one who wants to defend Islam and propagate Islam. Um, this is a whole topic in itself, a whole lecture in itself. I would advise you to be wise, uh, to be smart, um, to seek help and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost, okay, uh, in everything that you do and everything that you say. Um, and seek the counsel of your teachers and of those who are more learned and more experienced in you before you wish to take action with regards to writing or saying something about Islam. Also, looking at that which is available, that which is out there, that which is the most popular or uh, biggest widespread doubt about Islam, um, looking at the people that you're speaking to, what is their level of understanding, what have they been exposed to, so on and so forth. These are all different tips with regards to jihad with the pen. Uh, but most importantly is to outwit your opponent. It's to be wise, to be smart, and to outflank them with the proofs and with the evidences. Come at them from aspects in which they're not used to, unconventional methods. Talk about things in a specific way, in a specific manner that catches them off of balance. And make bi'idnillah azza wa jal use reason. Okay, and intellectual proofs and arguments, things that are tangible that they can relate to in their daily lives, as Ibrahim alayhi salam did when he said that the big idol did it. And he made them feel stupid. They knew that the big idol couldn't move, couldn't talk, couldn't hear anything. How could he destroy the smaller idols? And he says, So why are you worshiping them? So this is in brief, this is a whole entire lecture in itself, and perhaps Bidin Azul will dedicate a separate session to it. Allah knows best. This is the end of this session of these um, questions. If there are any other questions um, from uh, this brother, K-R, uh, or any other brother or sister, feel free to send them and post them on the YouTube channel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdi wa rasulihi wa muhammad. Wa jazakum wa khayran. Until the next session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.